Why don't we get started? Is the microphone on? I'd like to uh, welcome you all here uh, to this accredited CCC symposium entitled Aspirin DAPT or Dual Therapy. Uh, I know that a lot of people are in the back uh, still waiting to get some food. Uh, we are going to have a full house uh, for this symposium uh, and uh, there are a lot of seats up front so if you are able to get your plate you can come directly up front uh, and then I hope that we may be able to add some seats um, in the back to the meeting organizers because I'm just looking at the, the sheer volume of people here and uh, I don't think we'll have enough seating for everyone. Um, but it's a pleasure uh, to be here on, on behalf of the faculty. Uh, we've designed uh, uh, what we think is an excellent case-based uh, symposium uh, today uh, where we will be reviewing uh, a lot of the new data as it relates to long-term uh, dual antiplatelet therapy. So I'd like to uh, welcome our faculty uh, on the extreme right, uh, we have Jean-Francois Tanguay from the Montreal Heart Institute, uh, and Jacob Udell from the University of Toronto, Graham Wong from the University of British Columbia, Eva Lon from McMaster University, and Robert Welsh from the University of Alberta, and I'm Shamir Mehta, by the way, from McMaster University. Um, so, pleasure to be here. Um, so, all of the individuals uh, that you see up here uh, form the planning committee uh, for this symposium. And our disclosures are on the next several slides, and I'll just run through these slides. Those are my disclosures, uh, Eva Lon's disclosures, Jacob Udell's disclosures, uh, Robert Welsh's disclosures, Jean-Francois Tonguet's disclosures, Graham Wong's disclosures. So um, the agenda today uh, is, is, is a packed agenda. We wanted to keep this interesting, and we wanted to have a rapid-fire type uh, approach rather than long didactic talks uh, around each topic. And so we'll have a brief five-minute introduction uh, by Eva Lon on the um, overcoming inertia in stable atherosclerotic coronary artery disease. And then we're going to have a debate, and I've seen the slides uh, for the debate between uh, Jacob Udell and Robert Welsh, and it is going to be a fantastic debate, um, and there'll be no um, punches held back. Uh, and then we'll have two case studies, one in an acute uh, setting and one in a chronic setting, um, followed by panel, panel discussion. Um, there'll be a lot of audience Q&A, and I know you're eating right now, uh, but I think everyone has a cell phone. If you could open up your CCC app um, and be ready to answer the audience polling questions because there are a lot of them. The learning objectives uh, of the symposium are, are listed on this slide. I won't go uh, into these uh, learning objectives in detail. Uh, other than to indicate that the main um, emphasis will be on assessing the appropriateness of long-term antithrombotic therapy uh, in patients with coronary artery disease. This is an accredited program of the CCC. It's gone through all of the, um, the, uh, uh, the steps that are needed for accreditation. And again, the CCC app, I think, uh, will, will help um, with <laughs> Uh, learning about what you think, what your opinion is on, on these cases, uh, and you'll be interested to also see other people's uh, responses, and we'll be, we'll be hearing from our panel as well. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to um, introduce uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Eva Lon from McMaster University. Uh, no one better to give the opening uh, uh, lecture on uh, overcoming inertia and stable atherosclerotic uh, CB disease. Eva. Thank you very much, Amir, and thank you. I think it's a big audience, so that's very nice. Thank you very much. I'll be very brief, and essentially what I'd like to remind you that in spite of how good and how smart we are with our interventions and our medications and so on, we do not cure atherothrombotic cardiovascular disease. It's not a curable disease. So events still occur, and in fact occur more often than we may think. So that's the main message, and therefore we have to be vigilant and we have to adopt, when necessary, new therapies that may further decrease risk in our cardiovascular disease uh, patients. Uh, so I'll start with a case presentation. Uh, this is a patient that you see every clinic probably, 66-year-old gentleman with history of former smoking, type 2 diabetes, acute MI 
two years prior, treated with percutaneous coronary revascularization, and has also a prior history of peripheral arterial disease, stopped smoking then, and is fine now. He feels actually quite well, and he comes to the once a yearly visit to see if you can further optimize uh, his management and prevent events. In terms of current medications, he takes daily aspirin, 81 milligrams, rosuvastat in 40, perindopril 8, his blood pressure is 128 over 75, LDL 1.7, glycated hemoglobin 7.4. So what you do recommend at this point, and he feels well, uh, no change in cardiovascular preventive therapies. Add ezetimibe, add empagliflozin, add ticagrel or 60 milligrams twice daily, add rivaroxaban 2.5 milligrams twice daily. I don't know if we could vote on that. Thank you. Very interesting. So EMPA obviously is a strong drug. Now I remind you that in studies, glycated hemo in guidelines, glycated hemoglobin over eight is a recommendation, but in trials even lower levels were used. Riva from the COMPA study, so very interesting. Uh, we are working on new lipid guidelines and we may decrease the targets, which will make potentially the use of additional intensified lipid lowering therapy also important. So let's see why do we need to treat these people who are already on many drugs and to feel well. So this slide I'm sure many of you have seen, it's from the REACH registry and it's not that new, but things haven't changed quite that much, they have changed to a certain degree, showing, sorry, one year event rates uh, in uh, patients with coronary disease alone, peripheral arterial disease alone, or combined cardiovascular and cerebrovascular or cerebrovascular plus PAD disease. And you see when you look at composite maze, which is the most important for patients, uh, the event rates are still very high. So if you have multivascular, multi polyvascular disease, uh, event rates for MACE are over 8%, and even for cardiovascular deaths, 4%. It means almost one in 10 patients that you see in the clinic may have an event within a year. This is from the Clarify registry, over 32,000 patients uh, in more contemporaneous registry. Uh, with coronary disease only, so not polyvascular disease. Uh, some had pre previous MI, some did not. Some have symptoms of angina, some have not. And you can see here for MACE events, again, uh, event rates at five years, close to 11%, so at least 2% per year. And even for, cardio for cardiovascular death, MI and stroke, in, in the presence of prior MI, event rates are uh, higher. So even in purely coronary population, event rates are still there. Uh, now, uh, some people use the approach of targeting primarily patients with other markers of risk who may have more events, and one of the markers of risk, and not just for stroke, but for total cardiovascular events, is atrial fibrillation, very potent, as you can see here. Uh, this is also from the REACH registry, a more contemporaneous analysis, showing that in people with coronary disease or cerebrovascular disease or PAD disease, in the presence of atrial fibrillation, by four years, 25% almost, you can see here, 24% will have an event. So very high event rates. Now, the REACH investigators have published also a model trying to predict which patients uh, have more events and are at higher risk. And what stands out is polyvascular disease, diabetes, smoking, but also congestive heart failure, even mild congestive heart failure, age of fibrillation, whether they do or do not take their medications, and there are some regional variations. This is another uh, model derived from uh, REACH, but also from SMART. It's only in patients with established cardiovascular disease from North America, Europe, and the Netherlands. And again, the same things come out in all of these models, and this is a life time model for recurrent events. Uh, again, polyvascular disease stands out, diabetes, current smoking to a lesser extent, uh, blood pressure per unit change in cholesterol, atrial fibrillation, congestive heart failure. So those are the patients that may feel well, but they may have NYH class two heart failure symptoms or atrial fibrillation with controlled ventricular rate. So those are people at high risk. 
Now, what about clinical trials we saw in registries? What about in clinical trials? This is from the SOLID trial, and the reason we put it up, it used uh, the Raplatib, which did not show benefit, but it stood out by the very high use of other evidence-proven therapies, as shown here, almost all patients had guidelines-indicated therapies, and you see, in spite of that, by one year post-MI, about 8% had an event, and by three years, uh, this is almost, it's about 15 to 16%, so a large proportion of patients. How about other trials? So I tabulated here some of the recent large randomized controlled trials in stable chronic vascular disease on target stability, improved Fourier Pegasus compass, and you can see in the control arm for MACE events, improved, it's an expanded uh, uh, outcome, so the event rates are higher, was also maybe slightly higher risk population, but you see they're at least in the 3% per year event rate. And even in the active treatment arm, even in trials that, did, that showed benefit for the new intervention, still event rates, yearly event rates come fairly close to 3% per year. So if you run a busy practice, that's a large number of your patients. Another thing that's important is not only to know that the patient is at high risk, but is your new intervention that you are proposing on top of everything else going to decrease that risk? So is that risk profile sensitive to the new intervention that you will introduce? And Dr. Anand from our institution looked within the COMPASS trial and identified that people with polyvascular disease, mild, moderate heart failure in LHA class 1, 2, chronic kidney disease and diabetes in particular were at not only at higher risk, but more likely to derive benefit from the study intervention. She used two um, regression models to derive, to identify people at higher risk, where the risk factors were, uh, as mentioned, uh, polyvascular disease, diabetes, heart failure, uh, and uh, decreased renal function. And you can see that for 30 months, numbers needed to treat if you had no high risk, uh, sorry, event prevent, events prevented per thousand patients treated, if you had no high-risk features, were a third of those who had high-risk features. So not only are those at high risk, but they benefited more from this specific intervention. And also when looking at the downside of the intervention in campus, they did not seem to bleed more. And this is here my last slide. And this is where we are now. So we're already pretty good. You know, Shamir and the other guys, they take care of the acute business, acute MI, then they come to me in cardiac rehab and in heart failure and we try to treat the rest, but there's still these residual risks that I highlighted, and we have to choose, do nothing or do one of the many things that are available now, and I only listed interventions that are proven in randomized controlled trials, which we still hold as the highest, evidence of, uh, highest level of evidence. So should we uh, approach uh, a residual risk by more aggressive LDL lowering, as that in my PCSK9 inhibition, triglyceride lowering, the new intervention tested in reduce it, quite successful, more aggressive blood pressure lowering to lower targets, what we have seen in SPRINT, reducing further thrombosis even in the absence of atrial fibrillation, Pegasus DAPT compass trials, reducing inflammation, we have Cantos, the agent isn't available, but other anti-inflammatory tests are under investigation, and especially in people with diabetes, but maybe even in people without diabetes, using some of these glucose lowering intervention that may have other benefits as well to reduce this risk. So I think I'll end here. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. And we're going to jump now into the debates. Uh, so the debate question is, be, be it resolved in stable ASCVD patients, aspirin is enough. Okay, so that's the question, uh, and I would, I'll just frame a context to this, that it's, uh, as, when we're saying aspirin is enough, it's in relation to antithrombotic drugs. So we're not talking about lipid lowering and, and other therapies that Eva just mentioned. Okay, and we have um, an audience response question. Uh, so this is the pre-debate uh, <coughs> question, and then we'll see if, if, if your answer changed post-debate. So aspirin is enough, A yes, B no. Go ahead and vote.
Okay, so it looks like about three quarters uh, are saying aspirin is not enough and about a quarter are saying aspirin is enough. Well, we have a two-sided debate uh, and I'd, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, the first speaker who will be arguing that aspirin is enough, uh, Dr. Jacob Udell uh, from the University of Toronto. Jake. Thank you, Dr. Mehta. Thank you for inviting me today. So to stay on time, we're going to jump right into it. Um, another polling question. So you've said three quarters of the audience have said that aspirin is uh, not enough and that there may be something more. So that said, I put you to the test. I most often currently treat patients with long-standing stable ASCVD or chronic coronary syndrome as now turned by the ESC guidelines with A, aspirin alone, B, aspirin plus a second antiplatelet therapy, C, aspirin plus low-dose rivaroxaban, D, a non-aspirin antiplatelet therapy like clopidogrel, ticagrelor, or protasigrel, an antithrombotic therapy alone strategy, or none of the above. So, in contrary to what we were just asked by a binary decision, when I put you to the test, 80% of the audience is voting for aspirin alone. That reminds me a lot of the current debate we just had in our country. Um, my respective colleague here comes from the Venus states, from the Venus provinces, whereas I am here in the deep arterial bed of Toronto and GTA. So I think it'll be a healthy uh, for us to discuss this between us. And so I have four minutes now, two minutes and 57 seconds, and I'm going to just discuss then four myths. You've seen Professor Lon's uh, discussion. Four myths and four facts to help support my side of the argument. Myth number one, that the residual rate of recurrent thrombotic events the, the, you know, those who are the fear mongers amongst us say that the first year, if you quote, uh, you know, uh, Bob Harris and Bob Harrington and uh, Kristen Newby recently said, is about five to 10% residual first year event rates after um, an ACS and only modest improvement in the past 20 years despite advances in revascularization and potent antiplatelet therapy. However, the fact is, again, in a stable atherosclerotic patient population, several months out of any um, you know, prior MI, with a mean of 23 months of follow-up in Compass, the control arm of the aspirin alone had a 5.4% event rate, or annualized to 2.8% annualized per year, versus 4.1% with rivaroxaban plus aspirin group. So the absolute rates are still quite, I think, modest, and I think we have seen a lot of improvements. Professor Lon showed you that whole circle of, of uh, preventative care that we are now applying to our patients. So where does this fit in? Myth number two. The net clinical benefit in Compass favored the combination of rivaroxaban plus aspirin. Shown here is, the, is a highlight from the New England paper where you see a 4.7% event rate in the Riva plus aspirin for net clinical benefit versus 5.9% in the aspirin alone, a 20% risk reduction, um, a 1.2% absolute risk reduction, uh, considered a home run in terms of net clinical benefit. Fact, when you look a little deeper of what net clinical benefit was in the trial, they have the primary outcome on the top that I've highlighted there in the purple, and as well as the major bleeding events that were included in the net clinical benefit. However, for some ominous reason, I'm, I still don't understand other major bleeding, which represents actually the vast majority of bleeding that happened under major bleeding, was omitted from the net clinical benefit equation. And perhaps our panelists can defend that and explain to me why. And when you add that up with the net clinical benefit results at the bottom of that slide, you end up with a wash, in my opinion. 7% in the Riva plus aspirin group, 7.1% in the aspirin alone group. And so I think, you know, there's been a little bit maybe of selective decision making with regards to the major bleeding. We can debate whether that is, is appropriate or not. And the same thing was seen in dual antiplatelet therapy. I'm a reformed antithrombotic, extended antithrombotic uh, therapy uh, agent, as you'll hear, I'm sure, from Dr. Welsh in a moment. But in here, when we did a meta-analysis with 30 months of follow-up with an 18 months post-ACS patient population across all the clinical trials that did extended dual antiplatelet therapy versus aspirin alone, um, we show here a 7.5% event rate in the aspirin group, 6.4% event rate uh, in, in the extended DAP group. However, there is no free lunch, a consistent you know, relative risk reduction of about 20, 22% with an increase in major bleeding that maybe you could argue is essentially a neutral dis decision between the two. In, in fairness, old cause mortality, uh, major uh, intracerebral hemorrhage fatal bleeding are not increased. Myth number three. Well, this beautiful paper that John Eichelboom uh, followed up from uh, the, main, the main compass results in, in Jack this year showed that the major amount of bleedings were, were, were actually GI bleeds. And so if major bleeding is mostly GI bleeds in the first year of therapy, about a two-fold increased risk, that's less of a concern. It's non-fatal. We can treat them. We can start at PPI agents, for instance. Well, here's the facts. Remember that compass was actually a factorial design study. 
those results of the Pantopos alarm was just finally published and, in my opinion, very under the radar published in, in the Journal of Gastroenterology. And the reason for that is, is that actually GI events were quite low. But the, and so the trial overall was under power to answer this, but the PPIs in patients with stable atherosclerotic disease receiving low-dose Riva with or without aspirin did not reduce upper GI events. It may reduce gastroduodenal events, but we just don't know the answer to that question. So what can we do about GI bleeds supportive care, but I don't think PPIs are the answer maybe. <coughs> That's, I think, quite provocative since we all think that PPIs will help reduce the risk of this. And at 12 months, GI bleeds are not insignificant from a cost perspective. They cost on average about $40,000 per year per hospitalization for treating these patients, and not an insignificant impact on our healthcare system. And my last myth, there is a ton of confidence and investment planned to integrate the findings from COMPASS and other dual antiplatelet trials into routine clinical practice. Here's the facts. Bayer just announced two weeks ago that they've made a major investment in Ioannis' anti-sense 11A inhibitor, the oligonucleotide which works here, as you can see on the right-hand side, by the intrinsic pathway. Thought that the RNAs will uh, then break down the development of factor 11A, and it's thought that at this early stage, there may be even much significant lower bleeding than there is with anti-10A with factor 2 inhibitors. And so already, the major sponsor of these findings are already investing in other therapies. I think when the market speaks to that approach, you have to wonder in clinical practice whether we should just be cautious about introducing these therapies. That is my four points, and I look forward to a discussion uh, with Dr. Welsh. Excellent. Thank you, Jay. Our, Our next speaker is uh, Rob Welsh from the University of Alberta, who will be arguing that aspirin is not enough. Well, it's an absolute pleasure to defend the obvious answer that, be it resolved in stable atherosclerotic cardiac disease, that aspirin is not enough. When we actually get into this discussion, um, Jay was very excited to take on this, this journey. In fact, he was a little bit smug about the the fact that he wanted to defend aspirin, and he convinced me that he was going to walk you down this yellow brick road and take you to the Wizard of Oz. And if you all know, the Wizard of Oz was a fake. Um, but anyway, it's amazing what you can get directly from Jay's own thing. He's already posted this debate night that he's already taking you guys down this path. And ironically, I'd never seen this on Twitter, but if you look at the bottom, there's actually pictures that he's pre-implanted called Smug Jay. This is Jay convinced he's going to win. And then there's, there's Confused Jay, and this is the one that I think we're honestly dealing with right now. And then the one that really gets me is Jay has friends in the audience that are actively tweeting, and when he talked about some of the myths and facts he just said, they took pictures of themselves in complete shock and surprise of Jay's comments. So anyway, Twitter is very interesting, we might come back to that near the end. So let's do a very quick rundown of a 66-year-old lady, hypertension, dyslipidemia, diabetes, and a prior STEMI 20 months ago. She comes into your outpatient clinic. She has dyspion exertion about one block. Her EF in the past was shown to be mildly reduced 40 to 45%, and she had moderate diffuse coronary artery disease with stenting. If you take that patient in a real-world population, this is every patient that survives to hospital in the Alberta province, and you look at them with enriching features of either diabetes or heart failure, not only is their residual risk high, it's very scary. It's 33% risk with diabetics of an event rate death MI and stroke at three years, and with heart failure, it's 56%. And unfortunately, the majority of both of those patient populations, their main event is death, which is shown on the bottom. Now, if you take the first year out, that rate does drop. I admit that, but it remains 4 to 5% in these enriched patients. The COMPASS results should be well known to you at this point, but what I've done is tried to summarize them in a very simplistic slide that shows the primary endpoint, the CV death endpoint, stroke and MI, and just to pause one second before we move on into CV death, how many therapies do we have in a single randomized trial in a stable population saved lives? We've got some therapies that we combined in meta-analyses where we show modest death reduction, but how many agents do we have that actually save lives, 22% reduction in CV death? The other thing is if you think about this stable patient population, you ask them, you sit your next patient down in your clinic and you say, what are you scared of most? Stroke, 
heart attack, death, all of them are going to say stroke. Stroke is a devastating complication. And on this slide, you can see that the aspirin river oxaban strategy compared to aspirin alone in this so-called stable population decreases your risk of an ischemic stroke by 50%, and even more impressive, almost a 70% reduction in hemorrhagic conversion of your stroke if you have one. You may argue, why would more antithrombotic do that? It's a pretty simple answer. I think you have smaller strokes, therefore you have smaller risk of hemorrhagic con uh, conversion and no increased risk of ICH. Now bleeding is something that we're going to need to talk more about, obviously. If you look at fatal bleeding, non-fatal ICH, non-fatal critical organ bleeding, the ones that really matter, they are completely neutral. And there's a sensitive test. The FDA mandated a very sensitive test of bleeding in this trial, and it was increased modestly. Um, if you look at the top slide, the more interesting thing about bleeding is it is front-loaded. Patients, if they're going to bleed, bleed early on, and if they don't, you can look at the one to two year results, the two year results shown on that top bar, and bleeding is actually incredibly neutral compared to aspirin. And then if you reflect on bleeding a little bit more, um, this has been something that I think is very impressive. 10% of people that bled in the trial were investigated and found to have cancer. Now, if you think about that, a GI bleed in this patient population, do you have a single screening test? I know we're cardiologists, we don't think about cancer screening, but do you have a single test in practice that we know of that has a one in 10 pickup rate for screening for cancer? And I went to the website and spent some time reading about this, probably about 40 hours of reading about cancer, and uh, this is clearly the best screen we have for cancer in medicine today. <clears throat> okay, so back to the concept of net clinical benefit. My colleague has told you there is none. Well, I would like you to look at this slide. Blue is 12 months of therapy. Red is 24. Green is 30 months of therapy. Because the front-loaded bleeding goes away with time, your net clinical benefit and the patient I showed you falls into these two categories. We don't have them as additive, but I guarantee you it'd be even higher in the patient that I talked to you about where you see impressive net clinical benefits. Jumping into the final arbitrator of net clinical benefit, not only was CV death reduced, but all cause mortality was reduced. And Jay's already showed you his publication, which was very nice. But in that publication with DAPT, not with dual pathway inhibition, he opined that 60% of mortality is in fact CV death, and dual antiplatelet therapy decreased mortality in that group by 15%. So I'm not saying every single patient needs to be intensified from aspirin to other therapies, but we have complementary options. Some patients, aspirin is fine. We accept that. But in some patients, maybe early on, the cases will show this. DAPT is your strategy and other dual pathways your strategy. And this is just simplistic side trying to put together the pieces uh, of an opinion piece on how to move forward. So let's go back to our patient before I end. This patient had heart failure. If you look at the two red lines in this, the top one is heart failure with aspirin alone. The other red line is heart failure with rivaroxaban and aspirin. You see a very impressive risk reduction that would apply to the exact patient that I showed you with a very low number needed to treat and a very significant benefit. So I close by saying that aspirin is not enough in these patients. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. A rebuttal from Jay Udell. So I didn't realize Dr. Walsh is a cardio-oncologist now. I think there's a session just down the hall on that. So I'm just going to make two points. Um, you know, this is the inactivists are saying, settle down. What could, what's the worst that can happen? Um, I, you know, two things. I, I, I saw that slide. It, the stroke signal, I think, is very provocative, um, that the risk is reduced. I, I think we should be cautious. That, you know, we're debating a, a lot about this right now in the stroke guidelines that are hopefully coming out in the next year. These are primary prevention of strokes. We talk about secondary prevention patients, but really, when we talk about polyvascular disease, there are still three circulatory beds. And I think an incident of stroke is very different than we, we should be using these perhaps in patients with a prior history of stroke. Remember, there's only 3.8% of patients in Compass had a prior history of stroke. That's my only point about that. And with regards to first year bleeds being the, you know, declaring themselves or that we would be having a screening tool for GI cancers, I, you know, there are no run-in phases in life. And so it's not like you can tell your patient, we're going to do this for the first year, and then after that, you're going to just be fine. If we get through that first year, I don't think that conversation is going to go very well. Of course, you do want to counsel your patients about that. But 
you don't, there is no run-in phase unlike some of these trials that had that run-in phase. So imagine again if Compass actually started de novo without a run-in phase, whether or not those patients would only be those who had uh, bleeding in the first year. And I wrap with this. You know, we struggled with how to integrate the findings of Compass in the CCS antiplatelet guidelines. And of course, there'll be new iterations with now more secondary analyses that maybe will solidify our feelings about this. But I just want to remind you that right now it is a weak recommendation with moderate quality of evidence from a strong trial uh, to continue with dual pathway inhibition or extended dual plant antiplatelet therapy. Thank you, Jay. Rebuttal now from Rob Welsh. And so, we're going to vote again. So Jay's been so nice, I feel bad for picking on him almost. Um, okay, so let's play a mind experiment. These are proven secondary prevention therapies, okay? You have your MACE reduction, your death reduction, your stroke reduction, your MI reduction. I want you to look at these and tell me which one of these four therapeutic areas you are going to use in your patients. And if you tell me they all look really good and you're going to use all of them, I accept that. But if you're going to pick one, which one would you pick? A, is there any hands for A? B, D, obviously ending with C. And if you actually take these out, who in a secondary treatment population would not treat blood pressure, lipids, or an ACE inhibitor with hope? And we now have a therapy that's as good, plus has a reduction in male, major versus limb events of over 50%, and of amputation by over 70%. So just keep that in mind as we discuss these further cases. And my dear friend Jay, again, back to our, our friend Twitter, he was very proud to present this. He exaggerated how great these results were and denied how great they were today. Uh, but obviously this was a very pivotal paper that we all use in our treatments and Jay very clearly supports more than aspirin in standard care. Thank you. <laughs> All right. All right, Jay, you're going up against a pro. I could have given you lots of slides uh, on, on Rob if you just asked me. All right, so let's vote now. Um, this is the, the polling question post uh, debate. So, uh, same question be it resolved, aspirin is enough, and ASCBD. <laughs> so, go ahead and vote. All right, so we actually went up from before. We, we were at 75%. We're now uh, at around 77 or so percent. So uh, good job, gentlemen. Uh, excellent debate, uh, very objective. Uh, so we're going to now jump into uh, some cases. And our first uh, case is going to be presented by uh, Jean-Francois Tanguay, who's the director of the cath lab at the Montreal Heart Institute. Uh, he's a friend and colleague, and he's going to be presenting a case of a patient with an acute STEMI. Thank you, Shamir, and I think uh, the show off here today is showing that the question is very important, so thank you to the debater. It was really a great, uh, great presentation. So um, for sake of time, I have a simple ACS STEMI case, and then I have a question for you at the entry questions, and then question that we will address after that to the panel. So let's go. I hope the loops will work, and I hope I can advance my slide. Okay, so that's the objective, you know, uh, what to do with a patient who has a recent post-ACS and underwent stenting. So the patient is 62-year-old, diabetic, uh, hypercholesterolemia, he has history of tobacco abuse. He presented with a STEMI, I'll show you, uh, was put on aspirin ticagalor and then sent rapidly to the lab, I'll show you, and had multivessel disease. So that's his EKG with the inferior, uh, inferior lateral posterior MI, so big MI, big chest pain, so you got... Uh, rapidly to the lab, and again, I, I'm not sure in the back if you see, uh, but I think uh, the right coronary artery is occluded, you all agree, no debate there. And you can see that they come rapidly to the lab, so more and more they have a good uh, big thrombus load. So again, we don't use systematic uh, thrombectomy, but in some case we use it. This case we did not use thrombectomy uh, as per the guidelines, and so we all just opened with a wire, actually, uh, you had received aspirin to Kagadar. So just with the wire, you had flow. Now, obviously, the job's not over, but uh, you can see already just the effect of the wire dissolve in a way uh, part of the thrombus and reopen the vessel. So within the time frame that was recommended, we were able to open the vessel. You can notice that the guiding is not always the same simple case. We had to use an implants guider, so at some point that could prolong a bit the procedure, but it was, it was quite quick. 
And so, again, uh, very diffuse disease also. It's not that kind of normal coronary with an occlusion, you open and everything looks normal. This has diffuse atherosclerotic disease, I hope you can see. So, again, we implanted a stent distally. You can see on the right part of the screen. And the flow was reestablished. I mean, it was a dominant right, as you saw by the EKG, it was quite a high level of ischemia. Uh, and that's the result. Now, I know from the back you don't see. And even from here, some people say, okay, job done, next case, or whatever. But uh, look at the vessel. I mean, is the stent well deployed, well opposed whatsoever? So nowadays, we don't do that routinely, but in more and more cases, we would kind of do some imaging. So it was decided to do imaging to see what was the proper size, because the proximal right was smaller, then it's bigger, then, you know, so is it atherosclerotic? Is it aneurysm? Uh, so we did, uh, and again, this is even smaller, I think, from the back. But what we could see here is that there's some that malopposed stent, under-expanded stent, and some thrombus. So that imaging really led us that we need to do something else. It's underexpanded, so we need to go with a bigger balloon. So that's what we did, actually. And for the clot, I mean, obviously, uh, we didn't add to betrayer, but we said, well, this is a patient at risk of re-thrombose, you know. So does um, uh, the loop loop? I don't think so. Uh-oh. We checked everything. Let me go back to see if it's going to work. Uh-huh. Well, that's too bad. Okay, maybe with the... Oh, thank you very much. Okay, so you see, maybe you cannot compare. So the balloon was a bigger balloon, 4 balloon, and then we have a better result uh, with our stent, uh, and the flow was normal. We didn't have microemboli distally. Now we went to the left. Again, for sake of door to balloon time, sometimes we just go to the right, and then we go to the left to see, and there was some disease. You could see in the marginal, and you can see in the le right screen, the LAD also is quite tight. Even you wonder if the flow is not a bit uh, slow in the LAD. But the patient was stable, no more chest pain. So uh, based on uh, the evolution of the patient, we just sent him back to the CCU. He was quite stable. You can see that the ST came back down. He had uh, no more pain. And based on uh, what Shamir and the complete uh, David Wood group uh, showed, we staged those cases. So actually, day four, he got brought back to the lab. And we opened, again, I'm going quickly, the, the marginal with a balloon and a stent. Had a good result in that marginal, flow normal, and then we went to the LAD, same procedure. Again, I go quickly because that's not the goal. Is that we showed that we were able to completely revascularize this patient within a matter of four days. He was an aspirin to Kagalar. And uh, that comes to the question I will ask you. So again, the flow was good. He was discharged home. But the question we have for you, I have for you, is that what will be the script in that patient? So again, diabetic, dyslipidemia, uh, STEMI, clot-containing lesion, obviously, Three stents, uh, long stents. Um, so I'm giving some hints there. Uh, so let's go. What is your optimal DAPT duration in a STEMI patient with multiple stents, DES, even if it's second generation, more than three stents, more than 60 minutes total? So I'll let you vote. Uh, you'll have the choice, six months, 12 months. Next slide. Just uh, next slide. Yeah. You're quick, so then we, that's perfect. And then we'll ask the panel to justify whatever the, 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 the answer that you gave or what they would be doing uh, for their patient. So is there a timer or I just say that's yeah, enough? That's probably enough. Okay, great. So that's good. So keep that. And then uh, we'd like to turn now to the panel. I mean, do you have something to add or uh, what would you do? Uh, let's say uh, we come this way or uh, complete. Was it okay? We revascularized everything. That's good. Well, you, you got a, a great result on the revascularization. And that's exactly a complete patient because the lesions were all uh, very amenable to PCI. Yes. Uh, and, and you got a great result. And that patient would have had a residual syntax score of zero, meaning that there was no disease left behind. And that was in 90% of patients in complete exactly what you just showed is, okay. is what we had in the majority of patients. So I'll ask Rob to comment on antithrombotic yes. sure. therapy. So um, I, I think at one year, it's a very hard decision. If you'd given us you know, a two-year time frame, then I think I would have probably had a different answer. But at one year in this patient with that much stent, I agree with DAPT, as long as it's ticagrelor-based DAPT. I think clopidogrel-based DAPT um, may be a little bit less beneficial. And if that was the case, if it was clopidogrel-based DAPT that was your standard, then I probably would have chosen number four. But I did choose okay. number three as well. Very good. Eva? 
Yeah, I agree. I think this is a patient with a lot of uh, lesion-related issues, not just patient-related. Patient-related too, diabetes, smoking, and so on, but you showed a lot of lesion-related mm -hmm. issues, and that's where maybe TAP, yeah. at least in the short term post-event, is you would give very it. beneficial. Okay. Yeah. Graham? I agree. Um, I, I think this case nicely highlights the, the need for the clinician to individualize therapies. And uh, I just point to the audience to the tables in the antiplatelet guidelines that speak to angiographic risk plus clinical risk that guides decision making um, that I think points to a prolonged uh, DAPT course that's appropriate for this patient. Thank you. Jay? My only other comment would be is that I don't think in Compass we have a lot of details about the coronary anatomy, the coronary mm -hmm. lesions, and so this might be a black box for further studies. Thank you. Except Good comment. In Compass, Jay, the majority were remote right, from very the time remote. Remote. Yeah. So I think after, like, uh, like Rob was saying, after two, three, four years, it doesn't really matter so much, right? right? But in the first this time. is earlier on. So thank you for your comment. By the way, if you have some specific question, you could put them on the, the app and uh, Shamir will, uh, will uh, maybe the most popular one we could address because I have another question for you. So the, thank you very much, that was great. So the second question is, what if the patient has AFib? Another common problem on our CCU in our cat lab. So acute STEMI, uh, stents, revascularized, oh, on CCU, really clearly, uh, you know, not permanent, but some really, uh, let's say more than five, 10 minutes of AFib, hours of AFib. So how this would change your script again once you want to discharge the patient? So please vote. So you keep aspirin and you switch to clopidogrel and an OAC. You stop the aspirin and you switch to clopidogrel and an OAC. You stop aspirin, keep the powerful, let's say the Cagalor antagonist and add an OAC. You keep the APT and begin, begin reduce those uh, NOAC, mainly uh, Rirevoxaban 15, or a lower dose of another agent. Aspirin, switch to clopidogrel, and begin warfarin. So again, there's not necessarily a, a perfect answer, it's just to see a poll, and then we'll go to the panel, and we'll come from the other side. We'll start with Jay, so you can prepare a Jay. Uh, I think it's stable now, pretty much. Thank you very much. So, Jay? Okay, well, we've had many trials that might speak to this, and, and the panel can comment. So, you know, picking your particular trial, we, know, we don't have head-to-head -head comparisons of many of these different regimens, but um, again, in Augustus, you saw a very nice uh, result by potentially dropping the aspirin. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, I agree. You have a, a number of therapeutic options. However, I think with this particular case, a lot of metal um, in this, uh, this patient, a lot of potential risk factors. Remember, that in Augustus, uh, it, it, you didn't randomize you right away after your next event, and there was a period where you required triple therapy, and in this patient over here, I'd be a little happier keeping him on triple therapy until maybe hospital discharge, and you can consider maybe dropping the aspirin at hospital discharge, but for the short time after this very complicated PCI, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd like yeah, triple that's, therapy. That's not an easy question, but that's it. What Thank we, you, What Eva? we tend to do in our hospital, and again, there's trials in various different patients, but we tend to keep for one month on triple therapy with clopidogrel though, not with uh, ticagrelor, and maybe slight reduction in the NOAC, so RIVA 15 or uh, Apixaban 2.5 BID for one month. If the patient stabilizes, switch potentially aspirin and go with clopidogrel mm -hmm. and NOAC. Very good. Rob? Well, I think number three is an interesting uh, topic that we should really study. So many people are keeping aspirin clopidogrel on board with a, an anticoagulant, which we know increases your bleed risk to an excessive level to prevent the odd stent thrombosis. So I, I think, I know obviously my biases are coming across on the mic, um, but I think a trial of a NOAC using a more potent antiplatelet as a single agent, so, you know, ticagrelor, prazagrel, you pick your trial, probably ticagrelor would be my favorite. Maybe an, an equally attractive option, because clopidogrel, obviously, you worry about resistance. Aspirin, you worry about resistance, and in theory, you don't get resistance with ticagrelor. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very good. So the current guidelines would su support either number one or number two uh, options. The issue is when to stop aspirin. And mm -hmm. as, as pointed out, uh, this patient has had a STEMI, it's high thrombotic risk, has uh, stents in all three major coronary arteries. Yeah. The stent thrombosis rate is actually quite substantial mm -hmm. uh, in this patient. And remember the Augustus trial, uh, it was two weeks that they had uh, to enroll patients in that trial. The median was 10 days. 
Uh, so people are taking away an incorrect message from that trial that you can stop aspirin on day two. It absolutely did not show that, and the investigators uh, who I've spoken to would be remiss if that was the take-home message. They did not stop on day two uh, in that trial. The median was 10 days. The second thing to note, even in that context, there were higher rates of MI, there were higher rates of stent thrombosis uh, when you did that. So if you think there's no price to pay by dropping aspirin, that is an incorrect message as well. There is. It's the balance that we're talking about with bleeding. And as Eva said, in the first 30 days, your stent thrombosis rate is the highest. That's when you get the biggest bang for your buck. Thereafter, the stent thrombosis rate drops dramatically, and it's probably okay. There, the bleeding and the and thrombotic risk probably cross. Uh, so that would be the point at which to consider, at least in our, our practice in this patient, to drop it at about 30 days, between two weeks and 30 yeah, days. Exactly. And, and I totally agree. And that's why I brought this question, because uh, the take-home message, you want to make things simple, and you hear that you could stop the aspirin, and in the guidelines we say as early as the day after PCI, but not necessarily every PCI. Again, STEMI, tree stent, clot containing lesion. Uh, I'm a little bit worried, even if it's a second generation DES, that there's a, a risk. It's not a 50% risk. It may not be even a 5% risk, but you don't want to take that risk. And then depending on the bleeding risk of that 61, not 75, 80-year-old patient, that's very different, huh? or someone who has GI bleed already, it's not the same patient. So it's patient by patient, that's the message. And I think one month, it makes it easier, it makes sense, but there's no clear data. It was not randomized in those NOAC trial, the duration. Uh, so it's kind of not easy, but one month it's easy to make the script. At one month, you stop and you continue whatever, dual pathway, so it's easy for the patient, easy for the pharmacist, easy for us, and I think it's safe. If you stop the day after, again, the patient was four or five days in the hospital, uh, I'm not sure he has the full protection because this one by OCT, we saw he had clot, I told you. It's well opposed, but there was clot containing lesion. So again, that's our opinion. It's, hopefully it's gonna help you once you go back to practice. I have a last more question. We have four more minutes to go. So let's say that could happen. I mean, in the CCU, you come back, you put their stand, he's on aspirin ticagalor, he got whatever heparin in the lab or something. He has a major bleed. Let's say make it a major GI bleed on that during the hospitalization. So what do you do? Again, no specific answer, but just say what would you do in your CCU if that happens? The bleed is GI? Or? Hmm? Where GI is the bleed? bleed? GI. Well, I put major bleed, but <laughs> I said major GI yes. bleed. Okay, let's see maturity. Major, more animal. than five gram per liter of uh, hemoglobin drop. You don't know yet, but it's going to be GI, GI bleed. And I'll go again through the panel after that uh, to see what they would do in their own uh, CCU. Starting with Jay, I guess. So Jay? I, I hadn't looked up until now, but that's the, that's the result I gave too, which is uh, to uh, give the PPI, which I think we would say from, um, uh, what was it called again, um, cogent, where we know that there's good data that supports the reduction in bleeding uh, and investigate, I think is appropriate. I agree. I, mean, I think there's, there's going to be a lot of harm if you stop everything uh, immediately post PCI with the, uh, the extensive stenting, and obviously everything's going to be a risk-benefit ratio. But if you can stem the bleeding, investigate, and, and keep the stent open, I would be in favor of that. I would agree, but I'd always do an endoscopy as well, just to make sure that it's. I would agree, but I would also, um, you know, send the patient for endoscopy if he's revascularized, sure. and you know, you're not concerned about uh, his cardiac MI risk. Well, I, I'm going to disagree with my panelists and say stop DAP completely. Um, I think, I mean, although we worry about stent thrombosis, we've just talked about it. In the current era, most of us who track stent thrombosis, we're down to a rate of 0.6 um, in a year. Um, and if you look at your day-by-day -day results of stent thrombosis in this patient, major bleed means five grams of hemoglobin drop which is nearly a life-threatening bleed. So I think you have to stop your therapies. I would do an endoscopy and investigate, and if you find a treatable source, I'd restart them very early. Mm -hmm. But I think you have to get this patient under control because a major bleed is very close to a life-threatening bleed, mm -hmm. and uh, continuing your anticoagulants, antiplatelets at this point is, in my opinion, too risky. Yeah, yeah I, I, I agree uh, both with both Eva and Rob. So endoscopy, obviously, in many cases, you can, you can find the source of bleeding and deal with it effectively, in which case you can continue 
uh, DAP therapy, I'd probably shorten the duration of DAP therapy and maybe consider stopping aspirin uh, after one month of treatment. Uh, but in the case where you can't identify the source of bleeding, or if the patient's continuing to be unstable, then you have no option. You, exactly. have, to, you have to discontinue one or both. Uh, as was said. Obviously, but this is a to, scenario. To, yeah, yeah, just to be clear, though, I'm saying stop immediately, get the bleeding under control, and then reassess yes. Yes. initially. I'm not saying stop forever. So that may not show in the answer because we don't know what's going to happen to the patient. I just put major bleed, but it, it's a situation that happens, and the decision is should we stop completely the DAPT or should we wait? Depending on how severe is the bleeding, how active, how unstable is the patient, you have to take the best decision. And, and remember that sometimes when the, it's platelet-mediated, sometimes we have to have some platelet aside uh, that will, could stop the bleeding. But I would not give transfusion immediately. I would not give a platelet immediately. But I would question myself, do I stop one? Two, or do I keep both, depending on how major is that bleeding, how active it is. The patient usually should be on PPI, but sometimes it's forgotten, so then just starting IV PPI could kind of really, uh, you know, if it's upper GI bleed. So you need to investigate, that's for sure, and watch that patient carefully. Uh, uh, again, it was a specific patient with thrombus and, and MI, so I would try to probably, uh, if it's not so severe and active, keep the DAPT and investigate and treat with PPI personally. But if it keeps on going down and uh, unstable, then you have no choice to stop. So again, we're act actually perfectly on time. Shamir, was there any question from the audience uh, that we should handle now? Uh, there, there was one question that, that's come up a couple of times, and that was the effect of some of these antithrombotic therapies in women versus men. And I don't know who would be, I, probably Eva, you've done some work in this area. <laughs> Did you want to comment? Is I have not result? done work in this area, and I think it's the same. <laughs> Like, um, I'm not aware of major differences. Surely in Compass, at least, the subgroup uh, analysis did not show major differences. In Pegasus, the subgroup analysis didn't show major e differences. That's in stable chronic uh, atherosclerotic. So for not the same single disease. women and men, same safety uh, aspect for the NOAC. So. Yeah. 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 I think for the to be, no, not to be trained, like but everything the else, uh, is the same. With antithrombotics, you know, very small women may be at yeah. high risk. But here we are not talking about full dose NOAC. So yeah. it's not like the age of fibrillation dosing for small women less than 60 kilograms over eight years of age and so on. Okay, okay, thank you. Great. Thank um, you very much. Thank you. The next, yeah, Thanks, thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker is Graham Wang, uh, professor of medicine at UBC, who is now the program director of cardiology. Oops. He's also been uh, on the guidelines for antiplatelet. Sorry. And so it's a pleasure to continue with your case now. Okay, thanks. I think we're running a little bit behind time by my watch, so I'm going to try to blast through this as quickly as possible. So I'm going to take and extend JF's case, um, and I'm going to try to challenge our panel here. Um, ooh, how does this work? It's, the, it's not the mouse, it's the... Oh, this thing here. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so the case now, he's one year out uh, from his infarct. Uh, he's got a number of risk factors. As you can see, he is on appropriate secondary prevention medical therapy. Um, his EF is mildly reduced with the expected inferior wall motion abnormalities. You'll see his relevant baseline labs as uh, GFR 65. LDL is, I'm going to say, reasonable at 1.7 with a slightly elevated uh, hemoglobin A1C. Um, he is asymptomatic as far as you can ascertain on history. There's no bleeding on his dual antiplatelet therapy. He's appropriately beta blocked, ACE inhibited, and his exam was otherwise normal. So you have been asked to now manage his post MI medication. So I'm going to go and get you to fire up your ARS. Um, I'll take two seconds with this. I'm not going to waste much time. He's at increased thrombotic risk. We'll move on. Um, let's go and. Uh, now would consider your additional therapy, so we'll fire on to the next uh, set of questions here. So what would you guys do one year after his infarct? So he's seen the office with that exam, those medications, your choice would be either extend the dual antiplatelet therapy, um, switch him to ASA and low dose OAC, aspirin alone, P2Y12 alone, doesn't matter, put him on a PCSK9. I'll let you vote. Okay, so let's uh, fire this back to the panel here and get their thoughts on this. And if anybody wants to sort of comment from the audience, I'll uh, invite them as well. 
I, you know, I, 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 nothing, in my opinion, has changed from what we had discussed in the earlier case. I think we're still one year. I think then the debate about two or three or four years out. But if it's the same case with the same amount of metal and the same lesions, I would stay with dual antiplatelet. But he had just an inferior. It's a less complicated case. He, had, he, had, he has a wall motion abnormality and EF that's reduced. I, I think... Um, I think your P to Y12 alone is an interesting discussion that maybe we'll put to Shamir if we can, um, because we have one trial that was very neutral, um, global leaders, and one trial that looked to be supportive. And I'm sure people in the audience are having challenges putting the two together in terms of understanding them. So uh, reflections from the panel or Shamir directly? Uh, well, global leaders suggested uh I mean, they didn't see a difference for long-term uh, dual antiplatelet therapy, or mo sorry, monotherapy with uh, ticagrelor alone. Uh, but we just did Twilight. Uh, the Twilight trial uh, looked at monotherapy with ticagrelor. They dropped aspirin at three months. Uh, and there, there was a big reduction in bleeding in similar rates of ischemic events. Mm -hmm. uh, so it may be that you can uh, stop aspirin uh, at one year, uh, reduce the risk of bleeding, but maintain ischemic benefit if the patient is on ticagrelor. Whether that's the case with... Sorry, Shamir, Twilight is a different population. They weren't all post-MI. Post-MI is a different kind of fish, I think, um, than uh, most, elective PCI. Most were, actually. Most were... Elective uh, PCI is different. No, no, most were uh, post-MI, and that data is going to be presented in a hotline next week, uh, but it was in the New England Journal paper and very consistent result. Mm -hmm. I, see. I think the theme of a lot of the, the secondary prevention uh, post-PCI, post-MI trials uh, that have come out since the 2017 guidelines have really shown that drop in the aspirin does significantly reduce your bleeding. I guess the main question is the efficacy in terms of the backup P2Y12 inhibitor, which speaks to what Rob had to say. May I just add, if you are going to continue with dual antiplatelet, I would at least drop the Cagrelor to the 60 BID, which in Pegasus had similar efficacy and less bleeding. Okay, we're going to fire on to the next question. If you have decided <coughs> that you want to extend your DAPT, would you base it on a risk scoring system, yes or no? I'll let you answer on your ARS. Maybe I'll hold off on the panel discussion till I get the second part of this question, which I think is relevant. Okay, so most would. If you were to use a risk scoring system, which one would you use? And all three are actually on the antiplatelet guidelines as options. I'll let people vote. Outstanding. I love it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, panel, let's uh, let's get your thoughts on this because I think this is a very fascinating subject of what you would do. Um, okay, well, um, I'll start with this in full disclosure. I, I think what goes into risk scores informs my decision a lot, but I personally don't use them. Um, so I think that I do look at the variables that are in the scores and the direction they drive things, and I try to use that as part of my subjective. And the DAP score is, has been tested and, and shown to be quite flawed, actually, in, in predicting risk. So I don't mean to be a naysayer, because we say in the guidelines you should use risk scores, but I'm not sure we have the correct risk score yet. No. Well, we didn't. We um, didn't. Yeah. No, well, we, we, they're listed there just for completeness, but there's no recommendation. No. There's no recommendation in the Canadian guidelines to use a risk score, and the very, for the very reason Rob just said, that none of them had been validated. Um, so we were, it was a very bold recommendation, quite frankly, in the CCS guidelines to state that. And then I would say several months after that, there was the massive sweetheart study uh, that looked at the DAP score, which showed that it had almost no prognostic value. It could not be validated uh, based on what they had come up with in the DAP, in the DAP trial itself probably because the risk factors that predict bleeding and ischemic outcomes are very, very similar uh, to each other, and there's overlap there. Uh, so they're there. Um, there are tools if you're really stuck to use them, but there's no strict recommendation that you have to use one. I have to say, as most clinicians, I don't use the scores, but I use, again, the concept sure. of clinical markers yeah. for increased risk, both yeah. for... For, and, and that's uh, why we put the, the table of the, yeah, yeah, the, sorry, the clinical variable, the uh, angiographic variable the for angiographic. ischemic, and then the bleeding that are variable that are associated with bleeding versus we put the, the scores, but not 
recommend to use them. And they've not been validated, and some studies suggest that they're not that useful. So with all that being said, you've got four or five very experienced clinicians up here who I trust, maybe, with their subjective opinion and their experience. I think that health services research would show that if we don't start applying objective data, you'll see a huge heterogeneity in what to do across the province, across the country. And although DAPT has not looked very well validated, I think the precise DAPT, which came out after our guideline recommendations, has been shown to have nice external validity. Several papers have shown that so far. Uh, although it may not totally apply in this, in this patient population, better for stable PCI than it is necessarily for post MI. I think the, the take home message is that you do have to do some sort of cherry picking to understand the patient and whether that is a risk score, whether it's subjective, I think just blindly going and putting someone on something or making a decision not to is incorrect, but you have to put some clinical thinking into it. All right, I'm going to increase the complexity factor a little bit. We have a little bit of time left, but I'm going to be curious here. Um, how long would you start, uh, continue to do a line of plasma therapy um, or uh, do a pathway inhibition uh, if you choose to go that route. So I'll let people go and uh, vote, and then I'll uh, fire that up. Oh, this is fantastic. It's <laughs> that. I love it. <coughs> Paddle, thoughts, please. Um, so I, I can kick in to start and, and then pass to others. So um, we don't know when the point to, to stop if you commit to dual pathway in the setting um, if there's no change in patient characteristics. So I think that a reassessment, you know, yearly at every visit in a so-called stable patient, if they've had bleeding events, if they've had anything that changes their bleeding risk, um, otherwise, there's no change in benefit over time in Compass. In fact, it appears to look better over time. Um, DAPT, I think, you know, the Thema study suggested you'd have to treat for a long time to get a benefit in a so-called stable patient. Um, Pegasus was a little more attractive out to at least two years. Um, so I think it depends on your strategy, your approach. But I think every patient needs to be reassessed fairly routinely, that might be fine at one year, every year for increased bleed risk and also increased ischemic risk. Okay, I would definitely not go with the two, six months. This is like either you do it or you don't. If you look at Pegasus inclusion, it's one to three years post MI, so you have to go a little bit longer, I would think. But how long to go, again, it's not clearly defined. Um, and I think uh, it's, again, a clinical decision based on whether new factors for bleeding de develop, how the patients tolerate the medication and so on. Dr. Goodman has a comment. Thanks. Uh, so the median duration uh, of the clinical trial follow-up of aspirin compared to placebo or control in all the any antithrombotic trial uh, collaborations so findings, um, upon which we give aspirin indefinitely for life, um, was 27 months. Right. So I think, to your point, Eva, if we're going to give this uh, patient's high enough risk, months, give it months. for the rest of their life, uh, reevaluate obviously on a, at least an annual basis the uh, relative appropriateness of that, but you should be committed, I think, uh, based on everything else we do in medicine uh, for uh, an indefinite approach. So, so just because you're an expert, get back to the mic. I want to I wanna challenge you a little. Um, are you saying the exact same for both a DAPT-based strategy and a DPI strategy? Because I would agree with one and maybe question the other, because the benefit appears to lessen over time. I don't think we have an adequate power in those studies to make definitive estimations of the sort of reduction and relative reduction in benefits. So uh, I, I think everything we do is based on, for long-term secondary prevention, is risk stratify, and that includes the bleeding risk, not just the uh, reduction mm -hmm. in the ischemic events. So we have to revisit that with some irregularity. But unless that equation changes dramatically, um, for better or for worse, we do what we do for chronic secondary prevention, uh, I think, for a lifetime, uh, based on what data we have. Maybe not but, everything. Beta blockers we often stop in very stable patients after one. Right. I think there's whatever. question as to whether that truly is a good secondary prevention therapy in somebody who's had a you know mm. uh, small MI, no heart failure, no left right. ventricular systolic dysfunction. But 
the residual risk uh, for antithrombotic uh, uh, lipid modifying, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I don't see why we would stop therapy. Mm -hmm. um, that's, the that's a very good point, Sean, and that, that, question, that, that issue of lifetime risk uh, is definitely there in this uh, chronic CAD patient, and I think that's the right way to think about it. Okay. Um, a couple more questions. I'm going to batch them because we're running out of time. So I'm going to add a twist. I'm going to have two twists. First twist, I want you to vote, then I'll add the second twist. You vote again, then we'll go to the panel. So patient now develops PVD six months after his stent. How would this change your thinking? I'll let you run through that, and please vote. Okay. Then I'm going to add twist number two. I'll have not PVD, but a cryptogenic, not clearly thrombotic or uh, embolic CVA. How would that change your management? So the neurologist has no clue why the person stroked. And so now we'll flip that back to our esteemed panel because these are not going to be super easy, I don't think. At least the second one. Yeah. Yeah, so we were debating this one earlier, particularly the cryptogenic stroke. So on the one hand, you wonder whether there is subclinical AF. And again, as we mentioned, there may have been this huge incident of stroke reduction. On the other hand, in, in Compass, on the other hand, it's just fresh after a stroke. And whether or not now being on a dual pathway inhibition is safe, um, after the event is unclear. And so, you know, there were a bunch of, uh, you saw there's a stroke paper that was published. I, learning a little bit more, more of how those patients did post-stroke, whether they were continued on the dual pathway inhibition in, in Compass, whether they were stopped. I'd like to know that and to have a little bit of comfort. There was at least a few hundred patients, almost a thousand who had a stroke, um, that we could learn a little bit about those patients. Also, at least in the Navigator trial, that looked post-cryptogenic stroke, not polyvascular disease. There was no real benefit. Right. Uh, so, um, so I voted to, to stop, frankly, the, the, the potent antithrombotic agents mm -hmm. at that point. Interesting. Okay. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. for sticking around. We really appreciate it. I want to thank the panel for their great uh, input, and I hope that you found it an interactive session. Thank the sponsor, Bayer, very much for their uh, unrestricted grant. Thank the organizers. Um, uh, EOCI did a fantastic job. And thank all of you for your participation and for your presence today. Don't forget to vote and give us feedback on using the app on your phone. You can go onto the CCS's app and provide us feedback on and how we did today. And thank you very much.